Welcome to Changing Higher Ed, a podcast dedicated to helping higher education leaders improve their institutions. With your host, Dr. Drum McNaughton, CEO of The Change Leader, a consultancy that helps higher ed leaders holistically transform their institutions. Learn more at changinghighered.com. And now, here's your host, Drum McNaughton. Thank you, David. Today, we welcome back one of our favorite guests, Tom Netting, who's here to give us an update on the recently released guidelines for Title IX and some other goings-on in Washington and at the department. Tom Netting has worked in the public policy arena for over 28 years, advocating before Congress, federal agencies, and state governments on behalf of private institutions of higher education and post-secondary education companies. Tom is a leader in strategic policy development and advocacy for higher ed and joins us today again to talk about Title IX. Tom, welcome back to the show. Drum, it's a pleasure to be back with you. Yeah, good to have you back as well. It doesn't seem like it's been all that long this time, but there's been a lot of stuff coming out between today's release on BDR Low Forgiveness and a couple of weeks ago, Title IX. So let's just jump right into it. Jump away. We've got a lot to talk about. We certainly do. The The big thing, the BDR, the loan forgiveness, that was part of the last NEGREG, the NEGREG earlier this year. And the departments released their, their <laughs> guidance for how they're going to discharge loan programs. So the BDR, public loan forgiveness, this is, this is major stuff. It absolutely is. Uh, you know, they've, they've done a lot of work in these areas prior to the actual publication uh, or now the unofficial release with the f- official publication to come in the Federal Register for quite some time. And the Biden administration, as you well know, and we've talked about on previous podcasts, have done already a great deal in these two issues. In their summation of all of the work that's been done on borrower defense to repayment, including a settlement, another important piece of news on borrower defense to repayment was the California settlement that took place last week as well. All told, you're now looking at over $8 billion in relief from federal student loan uh, repayments that has been provided by the Biden administration in review of both uh, assertions of complaints and discharges that were as a result of those requests uh, and other litigation and the like. Uh, You also look at the fact that public service loan forgiveness, they have, they, the Biden administration have done a great deal in that area as well to clean up some of the backlog of areas where individuals believe that they were eligible for the public service loan forgiveness criteria and uh, have been given the opportunity to take those benefits, including the providing of the opportunity for individuals in the FELT program to use the one year a period from October of last year to October of this year to gain access to the eligibility criteria and to have their loans taken care of as part of, and their payments, all of their payments counted from the past. Yeah, so it's, it's interesting. We've got 1.7 trillion in student loans out there they're forgiving eight billion, you know, billion here, billion there. You're talking some real money here soon. They are. It's 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 a considerable amount, and 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 it's mounting. Uh, again, as you look at this new litigation, and I don't mean to take us away from the regulations. We'll talk about that here in a minute as well. But this new litigation and the settlement that took place provides a window of opportunity for a, a considerable number of additional discharges. And you look at the number of plaintiffs in that case and also the number of institutions that are being discussed. Uh, While there is a major focus on proprietary schools drum, there's also in the legal documents discussion about Villanova and whether or not other private nonprofit and public institutions that claims uh, based on fraud and abuse and concerns of misrepresentation in other instances might lead to uh, an opening of this up in a much broader sense than even where we stand today. Well, I think you're absolutely right. And as we were discussing before we came on the air, this is all going to be decided in the courts. Absolutely. You know, again, just sticking with the court case, and I promise you we'll flip back to the the regulatory side. Uh, You know, there is a hearing coming up on July 28th, which is part of the normal process 
but a number of the institutions that are part of Appendix C, those are the proprietary schools, are likely to have a, a discussion around standing. Uh, there is some concern about the way in which the department chose to, and justice even puts it in there, uh, in the actual settlement, that the department didn't review all of those claims individually. And there is a concern that the adjudication process was not completed properly and that in providing a across the board relief, while on the one hand might be merited, other, on other instances, there are a number of institutions that believe that it's not. And you know, what do we do with those set of circumstances? Again, from a fiduciary responsibility of the department, as well as the taxpayer, because if claims are being granted that aren't meritorious, the, the taxpayer bears the burden for those. It, yeah, it, it certainly does. It's Bring, which brings me full circle back to these new regulations, which attempts to kind of square the circle on a number of those discussion points, including uh, remuneration, meaning uh, the changes that the department is proposing to have the potential for the first time to see institutions and their owners that have personally liable and the department going back and we're trying to attempt to recoup if the school is still open or even if it's closed, some of the finances for that relief from the prior owners and or the uh, leadership of the institution, in addition, you know, again, to, to make the taxpayers whole or to find places where some of that money can go, can come forward. They've made significant changes to the proposal in terms of the process of review, who can bring forward the complaints, how those complaints will be adjudicated. Uh, they've made considerable changes. You know, we, we had discussions in the Trump administration of the pendulum swinging one way on areas like arbitration agreements and the ability to put those back into enrollment agreements and other documents. Now we're swinging back the other way. And the, pre the prevailing wisdom now from the Biden administration is that those are not beneficial to the, the borrower. So they're looking to take them out. So again, we see everything old is new again in some respects. Some things are new, new as well. Uh, but all of it is is very important because we are talking about considerable federal dollars. We are talking about considerable decisions and to say nothing of the perception of both overall student lending and also candidly the institutions that are part of various suits. Yeah. What I thought was really interesting about the, the stuff that was released today, it's making significantly more clear what's considered misconduct by a college, and it's introducing a new category called fraud, you know, that allows those institutions to be accountable. And like you said, not only the institutions, but the people who own the institutions in the case of a for-profit. Well, and again, it, it speaks to the two major areas in the new area that they've added. Uh, they had misrepresentation before, and there is extensive regulations around quote-unquote misrepresentation. But if you think about a number of things like Villanova and like other institutions, unfortunately, that have been brought up on questions of the accuracy of their U.S. News and World Report standings in terms of outcomes and the like, if that was used by an individual to determine their desire to attend that institution, that is a misrepresentation or fraud on behalf of that institution that could be grounds for, and in many cases, people believe already is grounds for that individual or a cohort of individuals to seek restitution uh, and relief of their loan obligations because they enrolled under potentially false premises. The new addition is aggressive marketing and recruitment. So again, if the institution under a new subpart F is using uh, overly egregious and sensational tactics in order to draw or influence an individual to come in the institution, there can be assessment of those criteria now to, again, potentially grant relief. And one of the other new additions uh, that you brought forward, Drum, is that based on assessment through audits and program reviews by the department on its own, there may be instances in the future where the secretary, not actual claims by individual students, but the secretary he or she may take initiatives on his or her own accord based on what they're seeing and develop the cohorts and provide relief themselves. Well, you bring up a really interesting point in that the U.S. News World Report rankings, things like that. We're seeing more and more institutions. In fact, I saw one a couple of weeks ago. They are not going to participate 
in the rankings this upcoming year because they're concerned the data that they were providing was not accurate. Correct. This this becomes a whole new kettle of fish, can of worms, however you want to call it. If your data isn't right, it could open up some very big name universities, i.e. Villanova, Western Governors. There, there's a number of institutions who could be opened up if the data was not correct. And it doesn't matter whether it's intentional or unintentional. If that data is not correct, given the new regulations, they could be in serious trouble. Again, Syracuse and so many others. I mean, you, know, you look at some of the other, and I'm not trying to point fingers, but these are just anecdotes that are out there being contemplated. Look at the admissions scandal out on the West Coast and the questions of what took place at Stanford and other very prominent and prestigious institutions. Because some people got in maybe on grounds that they should not have, and others were left out in the cold as a result of that, was there fraud that took place there? And if so, is there grounds? Are there grounds for individuals or a class or other individuals to seek uh, restitution? That would be individuals that are in the school, uh, and then you have the whole other set of litigation of potentials that of individuals that were unable to attend because others got their proverbial seats. So back to another statement that you made that I think is very astute. A lot of this is open and certainly fodder for legal discussions and interpretations. Yeah. And, and one of the challenges that I see is, and I'm putting my, my board governance hat on, which you know I, I, I wear sometimes, the whole varsity blues mm -hmm. issue that you were, you were obliquely talking about there, the boards of directors, when something like this happens, you have a, a, an employee who goes out of bounds, is the board doing their fiduciary duties to be able to ensure that this doesn't happen, that enrollment is fair and equitable. I mean, this is this is not a can of worms. This is a 55-gallon drum of worms. No pun intended, of course. Uh, I, you know, I, I would say if you're going to your bait and tackle shop, this is the whole freezer set on its side totally full of worms. So, <laughs> <laughs> And so, well, this is all going to be interesting. You know, these things just came out that the BDR and all alone forgiveness just came out. There's going to be a lot more news coming out in the next few weeks as people read it. Uh, is this going to have the public comment that the title nine is going to have? It does. And I'm sorry. I, I, you know, I, I wish I were a speed reader, but 750 pages from this morning to this afternoon, wasn't going to be able to be quite done. And to your point, I do know and can respond on the timelines. Uh, it's very clear in the pre part of the preamble, and the preamble is very lengthy, as you would imagine. It's where all of the discussion around proposed revisions and other things that they want to, that were part of the negotiated rulemaking, are presented as part of why they either chose or didn't choose to do certain things. And that comes from the OMB, OIRA uh, process as well with Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. But all of those discussions go into a lot of the development of what we see in an NPRM. Once it is officially published, keep in mind, this was the unofficial release. The official release and the clock starts counting for purposes of response when it's published officially in the Federal Register. Neither Title IX, which we'll be talking about here in a few minutes, nor this set of regulations has been published in the Federal Register yet. In both instances, there should be a 30-day comment period from the time that they're published in the Federal Register for entities of interest to provide their comments. Uh, you can rest assured that given these committee one, because there were the two parts of committees and NEGREG that we've talked about on prior podcasts, in committee one, which was affordability and student loans, not only the BDR and pre-dispute arbitration, as well as public service loan forgiveness, but there were other key issues that were brought up as well, a drum that are part of these false uh, claims discharges, closed school discharges, interest capitalization. So there's a lot, there's a lot of meat on that proverbial bone which is what the regulations are supposed to do, is basically flesh out the intent of Congress and put more parameters around it uh, to be discussed and to be responded to. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a whole nother kettle of fish talking about the, quote, intent of Congress. So, Amen. So let's swap horses here. Title IX. 
my head is literally banging against the walls <laughs> with respect to Title IX. We had the Dear Colleagues letter from the Obama administration. We had the, the letter that came out from the DeVos Trump administration, which changed a lot of things. Now it appears like we're heading back. So it's a lot of pendulum swings. Three major changes to this, this latest, quote, informal release of Title IX. There's many more than that, but if I had to narrow it down to three, no. uh, I think that number one, five, five okay, well, we can do five, um, but I'll, okay. I'll just uh, three to five and we'll, we'll discuss them and you can probably pull some other ones and we'll tease them through. One of the biggies, the biggest, in my opinion, the focus on victims' rights yet again, you know, as you talked about that pendulum swing, it's very hard, Trump, to provide a balance or some would attest that it's very hard to find a balance between protecting the victim or as the accuser, as well as the accused. And under the Obama administration, there was a great deal of focus on efforts to bring forward uh, the concerns of the victim, the accuser, and some would say less than uh, equitable ability to have the rights of the accused protected or part of that process. With the DeVos administration, there are those that would say that the pendulum swung in the opposite direction and that more opportunities were provided in terms of victims' rights, accusees' rights, at the detriment of the victim accuser. Now we've swing that, that pendulum swing back in the other direction. Cross-examination of the victim by representatives of the accusers, the process of the way in which the actual proceedings are handled at the institutional level are all changed with much greater protections of the victim and the victim's rights. Some of the key areas where that comes home to roost is on the areas of protecting individuals from on the same camp, potentially still on the same campus, from being distanced from one another, while at the same time still trying to provide adequate education for both individuals. All of those are major issues that are part of the discussion. Considerable, considerable new emphasis on protection for the LBGTQ community. Uh, and the ways in which all of those different, very important groups are protected and are focused upon in the course of review through the Clery Act and through all of these regulations. And, you know, a number of changes as well in the process that the institution is going to have to use. Uh, and that's where, again, from I think most of your listeners' perspectives, you know, we've had one set of plans that came out under Obama one, then you had to shift your plans and your processes of investigation as well as the court proceedings. Now we're seeing yet again, another significant set of changes to those whole set of procedural requirements, investigative requirements, who's involved to what degree and how those are then carried out and carried through uh, in the process. Well, there's a lot to unpack in that particular last statement there, Tom, especially with expanding the definitions. Uh, that's one, one area that's very interesting to me because the DeVos rule went with the Supreme Court's definition of sexual harassment, Correct. whereas the Biden is broadening that to all forms of sexual harassment. And that, and along with the off-campus conduct piece, right. that makes it significantly more challenging for institutions, but at the same time, affords more protections for potential victims. Absolutely. Uh, again, I, and you, you're starting to get into the nuances of this, which are, again, very, very important. Uh, the definitional changes and the determination. Uh, again, preponderance of the evidence versus the other forms of different threshold proceedings are major aspects of the, the process that are going to change. The inclusion of, as you said, a broader assessment of campus geography and where the assertions can, can, can flow to. You're right that campus geography under Cleary, under DeVos, shrunk back to the confines of the true buildings under the direct leadership, responsibility, and control of the institution, which limited, quite candidly, in a lot of respects, the fraternity and sorority houses and other off-campus housing, 
where unfortunately we know that these circumstances have the potential to arise under the new regulations. And from what I've read, and keep in mind, these are still proposed regulations, so they could still all undergo additional change, but they have certainly expanded that to include those other tangential or adjacent facilities would be my term to be more inclusive of those. And again, in the interest of protecting the potential areas where victims and unfortunately some of these circumstances have taken place. You know, to not not to to try and parse things too closely, but and of course, when you say but you negate everything you said before the but we all know that a sorority house, a fraternity house, something like that would come under the new regulations. But if it went to someone's own personal apartment, that would not. Is that a fair, fair way to parse it? Unless that apartment complex is owned by or subcontracted potentially by the university. So again, there are areas, there are still areas, gray areas, you know, there's the black, the white, and the gray. We all live mostly in the gray, um, where some of these things are still going to need to be further interpreted. But base level assessment, yeah, you're absolutely right that it is certainly too inclusive now of sororities, fraternity houses, and or other properties. Uh, You get into questions of what if it is, and again, I don't want to go down rabbit holes because a lot of this is going to be for further discussion as this process continues to unfold. But what if it is, uh, you know, a contracted place for an event by sororities or fraternities that is not on the, the property of the, the institution? Where do those liabilities hold and where are the responsibilities? Um, what types of investigations could take place? Again, and I'm just making this up, but you could see a set of circumstances where let's say that the conference hall for a local uh, Marriott or a local Hilton, uh, Hilton or any one of a number of the other the hotels and, and the like were rented out for a gala. Yeah, a, sor- a sorority cotillion, whatever. Something like that, sure. Yeah, and that makes it very, very challenging. Uh, One of the other things that I thought was interesting about it was the opportunity for informal resolutions. Mm -hmm. In the past, it had to be a formal complaint filed. Now it doesn't, which, you know, certainly helps colleges, I think, in many ways. But uh, again, if if you're not willing to, to fully confront your accuser, you know, again, we're starting to get into some some gray legal area. We are. And, and again, that's one of the ones that I think is going to be significantly challenged. One of the things I probably should have noted from the beginning, again, this NPRM is not, pu- not published yet, and they'll have a response period of, I believe it's 30 days. I'm pretty sure it is. They were both, I think, 30 days. But you'll recall the, the first two times that we've gone through regulatory changes to Cleary under Obama and then under DeVos and and Trump's administration, there were over, especially in the most recent one, between 120 and 135,000 comments drum, depending on who was counting. No small number of individuals and entities with concerns about the prior proposal. You can now imagine that, again, because there are two sides, at least to every story, Uh, that we're going to see a great deal of further communique to the department on these revisions, pro or con, different uh, points of view, different vantage points, all attempting to once again take what the department put together as uh, changes and see where it goes from there. Things like this informal review process are going to be, I think, significantly pursued as parts of lines of questions and recommendation. You're right, it might loosen up the school to a certain degree in some of their proceedings. There are some that aren't going to want that to be the case because they will then assert that there will be, as has been asserted before, and again, I'm not trying to impugn anybody, but that gives, that potentially in some people's minds gives view to sweeping things under the rug or not being fully accountable or finding ways to lessen the severity Uh, as victims or advocacy groups and others would aspire to share with you of the number and the severity of these type of events that happen on campuses. It was another one of the areas that was frustrating point for them when uh, the DeVos regulations made some of the changes that they did. So uh, again, all of these are hypersensitive issues for very good reason. And 
it's the balancing act that I alluded to earlier to try and find the, the right approach on such important issues. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not going to get any easier. You know, 20 conservative states have sued the Department of Education. Correct. You know, they want to overturn the department's interpretation of gay and transgen transgender people being protected under the loss. I mean, we're just getting started with all this stuff. Well, and, and again, lest we not, you know, we know what happened in the courts two weeks ago and the challenge is that there are some that pretend that that now means for uh, all sorts of other individuals and civil rights uh, the, the discussion. So yes, um, there is a lot to this and a lot more to this that I'm sure will be the makings of discussion. And again, coming full circle, very likely litigation or certainly efforts to try and further determine what what is or isn't the, the appropriate direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's... I, I don't think I have ever seen things in such a blender going on right now with so many different things and, and so many challenges. One good thing I think is that the Biden administration, and I'm swapping horses here, the Biden administration pushed off final proposals for gainful employment and other regulatory matters until next spring. I think we need to be able to come up and, and breathe a little bit before we have anything else. Um, they did. And I, I think that it's commendable and also was realistically necessary. If you look at the 2021-2022 negotiated rulemaking and the 16 major topics that the administration was trying to work towards regulatory revisions, not that all of them individually or collectively aren't things that, you know, I believe all regs should be reviewed from time to time, regardless of administration, if nothing else, kind of like with reauthorization to bring them up to present day. Things change. So the fact that they were bringing forth all of these issues, not surprising, especially in light of, again, pendulum swings and the fact that while the legislative process moves slowly, we've seen that from administration to administration, the regulatory process is where a lot of different administrations look to make their mark on interpretations and uh, the, their political beliefs in the framework of the, of the actual law. Again, I think that the Biden administration did well to not try and do all 16 issues before this November 1st. Uh, and lest your readers or your listeners don't understand, the reason that date is so important is because of what's in the statute called the master calendar rule. It is a provision that says for any Department of Education Title IV regulation to go into effect July 1 of the subsequent year, it must be published in a final form on or before November 1st of the preceding year. The rationale behind that is pretty simple and straightforward. The institutions, as well as the department and all parties, need to have time to phase in or be prepared for whatever the regulatory revision, revision is or are. Given the magnitude of the issues that I just alluded to that are in the first package, and the fact that there is a second package right now also being discussed offer over at OMBO or IRA, the June 8th package, as I refer to it, the package that includes BDR, public service loan forgiveness, and the other issues we just talked about was the April, 28th, uh, April 22nd package. So that other package includes some pretty heady issues in and of itself as well. It includes things like income-driven repayment, the 90-10 rule, as well as other issues. And we'll see those, I believe, again, they have now gone uh, to, uh, they're in the process of review over within the White House and the department. And I believe we'll see those come through in a subsequent NPRM, Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, and both of those packages completed before November 1st. The issues that were set aside had some heady issues in it as well. The issues that you raised with regard to gainful employment and a major focus on the eligibility criterion related to essentially all proprietary institutions and all short-term programs for community colleges as well as state colleges and universities and nonprofits. Issues related to distance education and online, 
the big discussion around NC SARA and the standards for online education, where every state with the exception of California has developed one set of standards for the admission and uh, elig uh, criterion for online individuals uh, that was being questioned and was potentially going to be overturned by proposals that were part of this NEGREG now have more time to be discussed in greater detail. Issues around financial responsibility and both mandatory and discretionary triggers are other issues that were being heavily discussed and concerns were being raised by the broad higher education community. Uh, again, many of these issues not subject to just proprietary schools. Uh, you know, again, a lot of people want to think that all of these negotiations are critically focused and almost myopically so on proprietary schools. But with the exception of the 9010 rule that's in this second package, every one of the other regulations is subject for all other institutions of higher education. So this impacts everybody, uh, which is why, again, additional time and additional opportunity for healthy dialogue, but further deliberations, I think is a good thing. Sorry, long answer, but yeah, no, it's, I under, there's nothing short about Washington. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so go looking, looking at your crystal ball, because we're coming up to the end of our time is, you know, it always goes by too quickly. Tom. Man, that was quick. Yeah. So looking at your crystal ball for the next six to nine months, what do you expect coming out of the department and what are potential impacts? Again, I think that we can, I have, I have the utmost confidence that the package, the, the two packages that we just talked about, uh, one which does have to be under the master calendar and one which is not, Title IX is not subject to the master calendar requirements, uh, an important differentiation. It's all of the other issues that we discussed, total and permanent disability, public service loan forgiveness, uh, you know, borrower defense and, and the like that are subject to the master calendar and have to be completed by November 1st as well as this second package. I do believe the department uh, will complete all of the packages that have been introduced in final form on or before November 1st of the Title IV issues. That will mean that all of those will be subject to a July 1st, 2023 implementation with some of them potentially having early implementation. Again, those things that are beneficial to borrowers may be implemented even sooner than that if the institutions and the entities and the servicers and the like want to. So I do believe all those will be done. Title IX is going to take a little while. Even though the NPRM process is a short window, you have to review and the department has to take great, I would submit, concern and responsibility for a full and thorough evaluation of what is likely to be, again, over 100,000 comments be prepared to respond as they develop their final regulation to the thoughtful positions on either side that are embraced in all of these issues and put forward a response. So my crystal ball says both the April 22nd and June 8th packages of NEGREG issues through the, the process by November 1st and on their way to implementation July 1 of next year, Title IX probably not in final form and, in, and included as a final rule before November. And probably I would submit probably not into the new year. Yeah, I would say probably March 1st is probably a pretty good date for that. Yeah, I, and again, you also have to keep in mind that you're once that doesn't mean the department isn't gonna be working on those other issues that we talked about, Drum. At some point, they will put those out. What they noted in the... Uh, Reg Info was that their anticipated date of release is April of 2023, which would mean that we would have until November of 2023 to complete that whole process for implementation July 1 of 2024. That sounds great. Well, Tom, it's been a pleasure having you back on the podcast, always full of information. Thank you. Thank you. And Drum, as these become, I think, a little bit more prevalent, uh, I'm sure you'll have, as you always do, other important individuals on to share their views and opinions. And I'd love to be coming back once we have a little bit more time or candidly, once we start to maybe see the NPRMs and the responses coming in to talk about what we see as the pros and the cons that our people are putting forward 
in these very, very important regulations. Absolutely. We'd be glad to have you back, Tom. As always, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for listening today, and a special thanks to Tom Netting for his update on Title IX and the other goings-on in Washington. Our next guest is Dr. Jason Boyers, president of Rosemont College. Jason has a semi-traditional higher ed background, which is why he approaches higher ed a bit differently than many other presidents. Jason believes strongly that colleges must innovate or die, and he's leading the charge to reinvent a tiny Catholic liberal arts college in suburban Philadelphia. Changing Higher Ed is a production of The Change Leader, a consultancy committed to transforming higher ed institutions. Find more information about this topic, along with show notes on this episode at changinghighered.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe to the show. And we would also value your honest rating and review. Email any questions, comments, or recommendations for topics or guests to podcast at changinghighered.com. Changing Higher Ed is produced and hosted by Dr. Drum McNaughton, post-production by David L. White.